Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's truly a, a great honor uh, for me to present this, and especially when uh, Dr. Graham is uh, joining us. I want to thank Selvi for uh, taking the time and effort and in inviting Dr. Graham. Uh, I've been a great fan of uh, Dr. Graham. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the basics of electrosurgery. Uh, this is specifically designed for first-year fellows uh, and also for nurses and uh, technicians. And our panelists in, include uh, Dr. Selvi Tirumurthy. Uh, Selvi is uh, our uh, education director in the uh, Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at MD Anderson. Uh, Joseph Zhang, uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, who has done uh, an interesting study on how to teach electrosurgery. So he will be sharing uh, some of the observations. Uh, Laura Romero, uh, my chief uh, technician at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, she fixes every problem that we have. And uh, Duke, uh, Duke Nguyen. Uh, Duke is uh, somebody very special. Uh, he is a passionate educator. Uh, he works for Irby and uh, helps uh, uh, all of us uh, in figuring out about how to use the Irby machine. And uh, most of the stuff that I'm going to share with you, I must admit that I've learned from uh, Duke and uh, I invited him to be part of this uh, uh, meeting. And uh, my good friend, uh, Roy, uh, Roy Sutikno, uh, who is at the VA uh, San Francisco, and uh, uh, he has been a great mentor for me. So we're going to talk about uh, electrosurgery. So these are my acknowledgments. Uh, I want to thank uh, John Stoline uh, for the endowment, uh, Mr. Charles Buck and HEB uh, for the grant, and all the illustrations that you see today are from uh, Miss Angela Deal, a medical illustrator, and uh, Sanji Suresh, uh, an educator who has been working with us uh, to develop the tech training program at the Houston Community College. So I want to take you through uh, these uh, topics. You know, when you see a patient, how do you counsel about removing a polyp? And what happens when the patient comes to the pre-op area? Uh, how do you prepare for electrosurgery? Uh, some of the basic principles of electrosurgery. And then once you're ready to do the procedure, uh, how do you set it up and operate? And then I'll share with you uh, what I use in my practice. And uh, the whole uh, course is basically for uh, removing polyps. And uh, I've not gone into other areas because polyp resection is a big uh, area and we can cover the rest of the topic sometime later. So say for example, you see somebody uh, uh, who comes to see you in the clinic and uh, they're all afraid uh, well, how you're going to take care of it and you should be able to tell them at least uh, now that you could uh, take care of the uh, majority of the benign polyps without surgery, and you could uh, manage the complications. And you could also share with them that you could remove the polyps uh, so that they do not come back. Uh, the recurrence rate is pretty low. So you could uh, share those facts. So when you So when you look at a polyp, uh, especially a large polyp, uh, to remove that large polyp, uh, you need uh, electro, you need electrosurgery, and electrosurgery uh, helps in the resection uh, using a combination of a cut and a coagulation current. Uh, this is true for large polyps, whether they're pedunculated or sessile or flat. In the last few years, what has happened is, uh, if you take a, a small polyp uh, that we used to do hot biopsy evolution or a snare resection, we moved away from electrosurgery because of complications associated with electrosurgery. And we are doing 
a lot of uh, cold snare uh, resection, uh, especially between three to 10 millimeter polyps. Uh, below three millimeters, a, a jumbo biopsy forceps will be able to take care of that. And when you think about cold snare, it is a mechanical uh, resection. It involves a, a, just a cut and there is no uh, uh, thermal injury. And because there is no thermal injury, you will not see any delayed complications that would happen with electrosurgery. So you could also share with your patient that uh, when the patient uh, undergoes a resection, if bleeding happens, uh, you could control the bleeding and uh, you could control the bleeding by using coagulation current. Recently, we are able to do something more with the snare. We're not only able to cut the polyp, we're able to create hemostasis with the snare tip with a soft coagulation. And now we are able to ablate the edge of the polyp to cut down the recurrence after endoscopic mucosal resection. So we are able to do a lot of stuff. And as part of this, I would like to share three important concepts uh, for the sake of uh, uh, the first year fellows. Uh, whenever you're planning to do a resection, make sure that you prepare the patient's colon well. If the colon is clean, you'll come out with a, of your procedure with less issues. Say for example, the colon is dirty. When a colon is dirty, and if you try to resect, you can have two problems. If the colon contains a lot of methane gas, you could end up with colonic explosion. So you don't want to do that. And the second one is if the colon is dirty and you end up with a perforation, the perforation would lead to massive uh, peritonitis, fecal peritonitis, and that means the patient will end up with a bad. On the other hand, if you resect the polyp and you end up with a perforation, but the colon is clean, then the patient can get out of uh, the problem with a just a simple repair of the colon without needing for a colostomy. So that's one important concept. Before you jump into electrosurgery, make sure that your colon is clean. The second thing is the colon wall is pretty thin. As you can see here, it's about two to four millimeters in thickness. Uh, on the right side, especially the cecum, the colon is about uh, one to two millimeters in uh, thickness, where you are likely to end up with uh, most of the complications. And on the left side, it is a little bit thicker. So important to keep in mind that the colon, although it looks beautiful from inside, it is a very thin structure. The other component that I want to share with you is, we know that there are different layers of the colon, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria and serosa. And when it comes to the submucosa, there are several things you want to keep in mind. Submucosa is the strongest layer in the colon. If you preserve submucosa after resecting a polyp, you can fairly be confident that that patient is not likely to go into delayed perforation. On the other hand, if you, if you completely get rid of submucosa and damage the muscle, that patient is likely to end up with a delayed perforation. So preserving the submucosa is one of the basic principles of electrosurgery. The second one is as you trace the blood vessels uh, from the serosa, as the blood vessels come up through the muscle into the submucosa, the bigger blood vessels are deep inside uh, the lowermost portion of the submucosa. And uh, as the, uh, you go up the submucosa, the vessels are small. Why is this important? When you remove a polyp, especially a flat polyp, and you lift the polyp, 
by injecting fluid underneath the mucosa, you will increase the distance for, uh, from the resection to the blood vessels. So you are likely to have less risk of big bleeding. So something to keep in mind. So let us talk about uh, what happens when the patient uh, comes into the preoperative room. What does the nurse do? Uh, it's very important for the first year fellows to really uh, get into the habit of not only trying to learn how to push the scope, but what all else happens in the endoscopy uh, suite. What does the nurse do? What does the technician do? And you can learn a lot from them. So once the patient comes into the room, or comes into the pre-op, the first thing is the nurse will uh, check whether the colon prep is good or not. If the colon prep is not good, and the patient is tell, telling you that I'm still passing stool, that's not the patient where you want to go in and remove that large part, because that can be very, very risky. So one thing is to check the, uh, the preparation. The second one is to check the implants, where the implants are, because that will help you figure out which areas you should avoid when putting the dispersive uh, pad or the return electrode pad uh, so as to avoid injuries. The third thing is you want to find out whether the patient has a pacemaker or a defibrillator so that when you plan your resection and apply current, you do not want to interfere with the function of the pacemaker or the defibrillator. It's also important to plan your resections in patients with these electrical devices early in the morning so that after the procedure, somebody else in the cardiology clinic can check whether the defibrillator and pacemaker is working before they go home. If you plan your procedure for these patients in the evening and the cardiologist and the cardiology fellow has gone home, you will be struggling to figure out what to do with that patient. So it is important to check all these things beforehand. And if you also look at what the nurse does, the nurse tells the patient to remove the jewelry and also the hearing aids uh, so that there is no burn as the current moves through the body of the patient. We're going to talk about the current flow in a little bit. So let's talk about some basics of uh, electro uh, surgery. So if you look at what happens to the electromagnetic sp spectrum, you know, you know about the different uh, uh, frequencies that operate different electrical devices. Uh, you have the current coming out of your uh, uh, the, the wall, wall unit and you have different devices working at different frequencies. For electrosurgery, our goal is to move this frequency to above 100,000, typically to about 300 to 500,000 uh, hertz. Why is that? At 100,000, you're going to electrocute the patient. So you want to make sure that the frequency increases so that you reach 300 to 500 uh, hertz. That's what the electrosurgery uh, machine does. That's what your OB machine does. So let us look at uh, the electrical uh, circuit. So here is an electrical circuit. Uh, this is the uh, generator. The generator uh, converts the current that is coming from a lower frequency to higher frequency, and it pushes by creating a voltage, and uh, the current goes from the generator through the snare and through the tissue of interest and back to the patient's body. And from the body, the dispersive pad uh, takes it back to the neutral uh, electrode socket. So that's the circuit. And uh, if you look at uh, what happens uh, when, the when the current comes down from the generator to the snare and reaches the tissue where it finds 
the flow of current is not going to happen, there is some impedance or resistance, then it results in a temperature increase. And that temperature increase or the heat that is generated will create the effects you want in the patient, whether it is a cut or a coagulation. Uh, let's talk about that in a little bit detail. So it's also important to know about uh, current density. Uh, the, the maximum uh, point of uh, uh, wherever uh, the contact of the electrode is the least, that's where you have the maximum current density. Depending upon how much of voltage you use, that is the pressure, the push pressure uh, for the current to flow, it will result in either uh, heat that is generated very fast to the point of boiling or heat that is generated slowly like a simmering cook will result in either a cut or a coagulation. Let's uh, talk about it. So let's talk about the current density a little bit. So you have a polyp, you have a snare, and say for example, you have generated uh, a voltage of more than 200, it will increase the heat where the contact is, the current density is highest here, it will increase the heat to about 100 degrees centigrade. And you also need to keep in mind, like the heat map, the heat map that actually right now we are seeing with COVID, it's the same heat map here. Uh, from the point, as you go on this side and this side, the temperature uh, drops. And uh, the reason why this is important is, if you hold your snare here, you have a lot of safety margin down, right? On the other hand, if you hold the snare here, you are going to create a lot of damage deeper inside that you may not see. So we're going to talk about it in a little bit later, but what happens to the tissue at 100 degrees centigrade, at 60 degrees centigrade, and, and about 40 uh, plus degrees centigrade? Let's talk about that. So at 100 degrees centigrade, it will create a pure cut. And how does a pure cut happen? We're going to talk about it. And then as, as we go down with a little bit uh, less uh, heat, uh, there's going to be coagulation that you could see as a whitening uh, during the electrosurgery. And then as you go down, there is a, still a drop in the temperature, but not normal. And here the cells could be devitalized that you may not see. That devitalization of the cells that you may not see is probably what is going to make your patient come back with the post polypectomy syndrome. So you may think that, okay, I did a good polypectomy, but the patient came back with pain and fever. And when you do a CT, there's no perforation. You may be wondering what happened. You caused a lot of deeper thermal injury that you could not see. So something to keep in mind. And that's why it's important to have the safety margin where you put your snare to prevent these complications. So let's talk about uh, the current density. This is very important uh, for us to appreciate. The less amount of contact, you get a lot of heat. And that heat would allow you to have a nice smooth cut. And this is true whether you use a snare or an ESD knife or a sphincterotomy knife. Uh, that's why when endoscopists do sphincterotomy where you could see this well, you allow a little bit of wire to touch the sphincter, not a lot of wire. If you allow a little bit of wire, the wire will move up nicely as if you're cutting through butter. So something to keep in mind in terms of applying the current density in your practice. You should have the highest current density to have the maximum amount of impact in terms of a clean cut. For first year fellows, uh, those of us who are a little bit anxious to do the polypectomy, you may have a, a large polyp and then a, and the faculty says, let's 
let's uh, let us uh, help you learn how to uh, squeeze the polyp and he gives you the handle of the snare and you're worried and you squeeze too much and when you squeeze too much you see there is a lot of contact around the polyp by the uh, polyp tissue so this is shown here there's a lot of contact compared to the previous uh, picture and then the heat generates slowly and uh, if you cannot cut and the snare gets entrapped in the tissue as the tissue uh, gets desiccated this is a complication that we have seen more often when i was in training when the electrosurgery units were not able to increase the voltage as required but current units you know if there is a problem it automatically senses that and changes the voltage to push more current and make sure that the cut happens but this way too much of tightening could lead to what is called snare entrapment and uh, uh, some of us who have been in the practice for a long time have had this problem where we could not cut and the patient had to go to the operating room to remove the snare so let us talk about we talked about cut we talked about coagulation and let's talk about cut versus coagulation how does the voltage make a difference so we talked about voltage right voltage is a force that pushes uh, current through and if you have a high voltage uh, above 200 and you apply to the tissue that high voltage will allow too much current to flow too fast to the point of increasing the temperature very fast to boiling and the cells evaporate and results in a pure cut on the other hand if your voltage if you still apply current but you keep the voltage below 200 then what happens is it increases the temperature slowly over a period of time and it it is below 100 between 60 to 100 and that allows the slow heat allows the cells to dehydrate and create a coagulum and that's what results in what we call soft coagulation and soft coagulation is used now very widely for two applications one is hemostasis and the second one is uh, to get rid of uh, cells that we cannot see microscopic disease at the edge of the polyp to prevent recurrence so we understand these two concepts right high voltage low voltage high voltage leads in cut and low voltage leads in soft coagulation all right you could also create coagulation by one other means and let's talk about that so here is a high voltage but the cycles are interrupted and depending upon how many percentage of cycles go through you could have 50 percent duty cycle if there are only 50 cycles that go through with the interruption in between or a six percent duty cycle that means you have a spike of current and there is a long pause before you get the next spike what happens is with the spike you drive the current you heat up the tissue but you need some more tissue to cut it but instead there's a gap the tissue cools down and that cooling period would allow the cells to dehydrate because the temperature doesn't go up very fast and that results in coagulation so this is the principle for of force coagulation that is used uh, in the machine so we understand that looking at the peak voltage about 200 it will cut below 200 it soft coagulates and if you have less percentage duty cycle you create a coagulation if you do have 100 percent duty cycle you create a cut so so to just uh, uh, go over this concept one more time because this is uh, it just takes a long time for a, a first year fellow to understand think about the 
peak voltage. If it is less than 200, you're going to create soft coagulation. As you can see, there is no cut. And this soft coagulation is used for hemostasis and also ablation of the edge. When you increase the voltage to above 200, it results in a cut. And as you can see, there is not much interference between the cycles. As you increase the, uh, uh, decrease the percentage of duty cycle from 100 to 50 percent, you have, you add coagulation. And if you decrease it to 6 percent duty cycle, you add more coagulation. So, 200, less than 200 voltage, soft coagulation, about 200, depending upon the duty cycle, you could end up with either cut alone or a cut and coagulation, all right? So I actually struggled. I'm not very good in electricity. I actually try, try, struggled and I said, okay, let me create a concept to help this. As you can see this, these are rabbit holes. You know, the fox is applying resistance. You can think of this as the, the tissue. And the rabbit is, the big rabbit, mother rabbit is pushing. Uh, if the mother rabbit pushes too fast, you have a high voltage, a lot of current goes through, and you can achieve, uh, depending upon whether the mother rabbit takes a break or not, you have a cut or a cut and a coagulation. If the mother rabbit becomes weak towards the end and it pushes only small amounts of uh, pressure, you get only soft coagulation. All right. So what are the uh, different uh, factors that uh, affect uh, the electrosurgery? You know, we talked about uh, the waveforms and power voltage, et cetera. And when it comes to uh, one thing that you want to keep in mind is you want to see whenever you're doing a resection and if you want to do submucosal injection, use saline because saline is the sodium chloride is a good conductor instead of uh, distilled water for your injection, all right? The other one is, although these are variables, these are basically fixed. Most units have a fixed uh, uh, amount of uh, a fixed uh, uh, type of uh, a setting that they use. And, the, and the, you had this one, the tissue is variable. If the patient is obese, if the patient has uh, other issues that may affect, but the single most important thing is how you apply the snare and learn how to apply the snare is the technique that you have to uh, be comfortable with. You know, how do you close? And as, the, as you apply the current, how do you close the snare further? At what speed is a technique that will define whether you'll end up with a nice clean cut. And as you cut, you also achieve hemostasis. The other one is how much of a time you apply the current, the, the foot pedal action. And it's also important if you want to have less complications, you have to keep in mind that you want to grasp small amount of tissue that you could cut rather than big amounts of tissue. If you take a big amount of tissue, you will need a lot of time and a lot of heat energy to cut through. And in the CCOM, if you say, I'm going to put a 20 millimeter snare and take a 20 millimeter polyp in one block, that means that energy, uh, not only the cut energy, the coagulation, but the devitalization phase can go deep into the cecum and it can result in delayed complications. So when you're trying to do something new, it's always better to grasp small amount of tissue and get comfortable in resecting smaller pieces and then as you learn how you're doing and your patients are doing, you can slowly increase the size, but never go above uh, 10, 15 millimeters when resecting a sickle power. 10, 15 millimeter snare, I mean. So that, that will fix the amount of tissue that you grasp. Uh, nowadays, uh, people have actually refined these snares. You know, the broader snare will apply more coagulation because of uh, the current density is uh, less. With thinner snare snares, the current density is going to be high. It can cut through, it can make it bleed. So you have to keep in mind 
and also look at the snares. As, a, as you take off the snare, look at how the snare is constructed so you learn. It's not just a loop of wire. So now coming to the endoscopy room. So we've learned the principles and how do we go about uh, doing this uh, procedure? So here is a patient and yeah, the patient is in the bed and we have seen the polyp. Uh, this is a thick pedunculated polyp. This patient is at risk for bleeding. If you don't cut and coagulate, not only cut, but also coagulate the blood vessels. And you ask the assistant to set up the machine. When you look at the machine, there are two areas. Uh, one area is here and the other area is here. As you can see, it's beautifully designed with a different color. And this area is all about the electrical circuit. And this area is all about your controls of how much energy you, you are going to deliver. So you need to complete the circuit because the snails are all monopolar devices and a little bit of bipolar device. A bipolar device is a gold probe or a bipolar probe that is used for hemostasis because the current goes through the device and comes back through the device, there is no need for a returning electrode for bipolar devices. So uh, let's forget that. Let's come back to the monopolar uh, setup. You have the monopolar outlet that goes to the snare. And then from the patient, it comes from the dispersive pad that goes into the neutral electrode. And uh, Keep this thing in mind. We're going to talk about this uh, uh, as we go uh, into the next section. So you put the dispersive pad. And where do you put the dispersive pad makes a difference. And uh, let us talk about where do you put the dispersive pad. It's best to put it on the lattice mass doci on the back. With the, it is closest to the site of electrosurgery in the abdomen and it has to be in a large uh, fleshy muscle mass. And uh, make sure that you don't put it over tattoos or bony prominences or hairy areas. And you want to put it away from the electrical devices. So putting this device is really critical and make sure that it's in contact with the entire surface of the skin and make sure that the patient has not put a gel over that area before coming because that will interfere with your uh, electrosurgery circuit. So you want to have a dry uh, skin and then you apply it over there. So now what does uh, the uh, technician do, right? He will press the button uh, to start the machine. And then the machine takes about seven to eight, 10 seconds to start. And most of these machines are pre-programmed and uh, you can have whatever program you want. And uh, Duke can actually help you in setting up the program that you want. And then you say, I'm going to do a hot snare and you press on the hot snare a button. As you can see, there are buttons here. Uh, you press on the hot snare button. So that's how you select the program. You start the machine, you select the program. And then what happens is, this light, the electrode light lights up and you have to press that electrode light, the button to engage the program. And unless you engage the program, the machine is not going to work. So once you press, your program is engaged. You know, you have the settings that you've already figured out up front and this is for hot snare and you're ready to go. So this is what happens when you say, okay, I want to do electrosurgery. This is what the technician is doing for you, but you should learn how to do this. So let's uh, look at this video. Uh, Duke has actually done this. So as you can see here, it takes a few seconds for it to fire up. And then you have the program, you select the program and then you engage the program. Right, 
So you have a yellow pedal, green pedal, a blue, blue pedal button. You, so you're set. You're set for your reception. So you have your snare actually uh, right there. And one thing that I would want the fellows to learn is to check your electrosurgical settings before you cut. And if you look at it, your machine is not here. The machine is hiding behind you. And you should insist that your team, or the nurse and the technician, brings the machine in front of you so that before you apply current, you can check the settings. This should be visible. The machine should be visible in front of you. You should know whatever settings you have. The reason that is important is you're not the only person operating in the room. You know, maybe somebody else who has done a procedure and they've changed the settings and uh, you have not uh, realized that and you try to use somebody's cell setting and you find yourself uh, in trouble. So make sure that you check the setting before you apply the heat. One other thing that we have forgotten is this. The assistant should mark on this snare handle. So this is a catheter. Usually the snare tip is inside the catheter, all right? And you push the snare tip out so that the snare tip is just here. And when it is here, you mark it here right so that this will help you to measure the distance or the thickness of the stock and for most parts you can figure out you know is it a two millimeter stock or a three millimeter stock or a five millimeter stock and uh, visually and make sure that corresponds to uh, the snare when it closes so so let's talk about this so we have the snare tip here and uh, that measures up to, that's the mark that was placed. And then you put it over this, uh, this uh, pallet and you know that, okay, this may corresponds to this. You are in pretty good shape. But on the other hand, if you are trying to remove a polyp around a bend and then your snare has actually caught a fold on the other side, then you may not see that. And when you can't see that, how do you know whether you're not getting into trouble is by getting into this habit of marking on the snare. And you can see here, this is too much of a distance, which, which should have been this much. So get into that habit of marking on the snare of the snare tip close to the catheter and getting the distance. This is especially important when you're managing large thick pedunculated polyps so that you don't resect the wall of the colon and end up with a perforation plus a bleed. So, okay, you have your snare around the polyp, you're about to uh, resect. And if you think that, okay, this patient is going to have a lot of bleeding, I want to use a coagulation, uh, you use a blue pedal. And if you say, I want to use the end of cut, you use the yellow pedal. This color corresponds to what you see on the screen, the yellow part of the screen and the blue part of the screen. And you try to press on and activate the current that uh, drives the uh, opens up the uh, circuit and drives the voltage but you don't see any cut and uh, at that time you do not want to be in a rush and try to struggle you should get back to your circuit and see what is happening and as you can see here this tells you that you have a problem with your circuit and you should go back and check uh, the grounding pad, whether it is connected right or wrong. Uh, if not, you may want to change the grounding pad or you may want to change the electrodes or you may want to change the machine, right? Different things you may want to do. So that when it is fixed, it will show that it is lights up. When this lights up, you know that your circuit is good and you should be able to apply the current. So typically, most of us you who use OB, and uh, I want to talk about OB here, and the settings. 
So we set it up as a snare resection, the endocut Q, uh, that is Q is for snare, endocut I is for sphincterotomy. So endocut Q, we use a three, effect three, duration one, interval three. What do they mean? And if you know what do they mean, you can actually learn how to change your settings to treat the patient. So effect means the amount of coagulation that happens in between the cups. If you have an effect uh, three, it is almost similar to a uh, forced coagulation. So you have a cut here and then a cut here and the interval in between the machine is delivering current to create forced coagulation. Effect two, means almost similar to what you get with a soft coagulation. And effect four is much higher than forced coagulation. Typically in endoscopy, we use an effect of three. And if you want, you can use an effect of two as well. But if you do not want any coagulation at all, all you want is cut, then you can bring your setting to effect one. So there's a cut and a cut and uh, there is no coagulation in between. So I hope you understand this. So see, see here, there is effect one, there is a pure cut. Effect four, there is a cut and a lot of coagulation. So, so next is duration. Uh, duration means is the duration of the cup. As you can see here, if you have a uh, duration of one, it is a very short cut. And uh, when you have a duration of one, you have better control. It's not cutting a long distance. Effect as uh, duration four is a longer cut. So if you have a machine that is set effect uh, duration four, with one tap, it's going to cut a long distance. If it is one, it's going to cut a shorter distance. So you could uh, use these different things. Say for example, I'm trying to remove a polyp that is stuck to the wall uh, because of previous uh, polypectomy and it is cut down. And I want to have a nice cut. Usually I try to increase the duration and so that I can have a longer amount of uh, uh, duration of cut so that I can pull that polyp out. Next is the interval. Interval is the interval between the cups. So as you can see here, we put an interval of three, effect three, duration one, interval three. And this is about 720 milliseconds. For most 10 millimeter polyps, you could put 313. Uh, for a 10 millimeter snare, it works very well. But if you are worried that your patient call it looks very juicy, very vascular, and uh, you are worried about bleeding, you could increase the interval between the cuts to uh, four, five, or six by increasing the interval. And if you have effect three, in between you're going to have nice coagulation, a longer coagulation. So something to keep in mind. So effect, duration, interval, if you understand these principles, you can change uh, the settings to suit that particular polyp that you're dealing with. If I'm dealing with a large, thick, pedunculated polyp, I increase the uh, duration, uh, the interval to about uh, six, so that in between I have a nice coagulation effect, uh, so that I have less bleeding, because these large, thick, pedunculated polyps will have multiple feeding vessels. So now we talked about the cut. Now we're going to talk about forced coagulation. So typically they use an effect two and uh, 25 watts. And uh, if you want to change it to something else, you can press on this button and change. We'll talk about that. And uh, this is an important concept to learn about different types of coagulation, soft, forced, and swift. 
and uh, it also talks about how fast it goes and how deep it goes as you can see here soft coagulation is a slow heat that is superficial it's probably the safest type of coagulation but you may, if you have a bigger blood vessel, you may need to use a post-coagulation. So keep that thing in mind. So when you look at the voltage peaks, soft coagulation, as we know, it is below 200, right? It has no uh, cut effect at all. With post-coagulation, the voltage peak is higher. You will see some cut as well. And with sift coagulation, it is much higher. All right, so say for example, you are doing a, a, a large polyp, you set your settings at 313, and, but in, you want to change the settings. And how do you change the settings? You know, every uh, parameter has a button and you press the button next to that parameter to change. And then you use these up and down buttons to increase or decrease. And then you press the return button to set it up. So that's how you change the parameters inside a particular uh, setting. So let us see uh, how Duke has done this one. So that is effect and then he's pressing uh, the buttons up and down to change either increase or decrease and then And then you press the return button uh, to get to uh, the desired effect that you want. That's how you change the settings. And I encourage all the fellows to take time to play with your machine uh, so that you know how to set it up. So if you want to go back to another program, say for example, you have done this thing and you want to say, I want to go to APC. So then you go to the guide programs, you press on the guide programs, you select the program, and then you press on the button. So let us see how we do that. So you press the guide program, you press the select program, and then you press whatever you want, APC or PostNet APC, and then you get to that. So I'm not talking about APC here because this is a large uh, uh, subject to cover with just a snare. So let me talk about my post polypectomy settings. As you can see here, I have endocut Q313 for most of the stuff. And if I want to increase, uh, if I have a thick pedicle, I may increase it to six interval. And uh, uh, for most EMRs, I've changed from soft to, uh, from force to soft. The reason I did that is because uh, if I find some bleeding, I don't have to ask my assistant to change from a post setup to soft in the middle of the procedure. And uh, I can use the soft coagulation snare tip and uh, con uh, control the bleeding. And once I finish the procedure, I can use the soft coagulation to ablate the edges. You could also ablate the edges with APC, but you could also ablate the edges with the snare tip, which is much cheaper. So that's what I do for my EMRs. And if I have a thick pedunculated polyp, uh, as we, we talked about in increasing the interval here, and I may use post coagulation uh, in between the uh, cuts uh, to control the prevent bleeding from thicker vessels. So some principles about how do you cut a polyp, right? When you think about a polyp, you want to think about preventing heat going deep. So you want to typically cut the polyp in the middle, middle of the stock. But if you have a shorter stock, I want to inject fluid and increase this distance to the wall and then uh, cut. On the other hand, if I think about there is a cancer here, then what is important is how far does the cancer go down to the snare resection. In that case, I am trying to cut a little bit down so that the pathologist has enough stock to evaluate. And in the process, 
I'm worried about uh, issues of my heat energy going deep. And I prevent that by injecting fluid underneath uh, the stock and making the distance from the muscle a, a little bit higher. Even if it is a pedunculate polyp, I inject so that uh, there is a heat sink effect from the cell line. So those are the principles to keep in mind. Because you know that looking at the heat map and the effects of a heat map, here is going to be current, you have a cut, and you have a coagulation going up and down. And uh, if there are cancer cells uh, coming here, and the, the guy, the pathologist can't say, you say it is very close to the margin. So you have to keep those things in mind during your resection. When you have a large polyp, almost occluding the lumen, one thing is you want to make sure that the polyp had, has not connecting to the opposite wall in a small area, because that small area is where the current density is going to happen and the current is going to cause uh, contralateral wall damage. And when you have a large polyp, you want to do two things. You want to have a broad contact or move the polyp so that the contact is not at one point. And uh, sometimes I actually use a lot of water to fill, uh, to disperse the heat. So something to keep in mind. When you're removing a polyp, you don't want to squeeze the polyp and pull it up as if you're strangulating the uh, lower portion of the neck because the current density will increase here and that's where you're going to have the damage and the cut. And you don't want to do that. Uh, the other thing is, if you have a, a clip uh, in that area, uh, that current can go through the clip and it can cause damage to the wall. So some of these things to keep in mind as you're resecting. The reason that is important is when you are removing uh, large flat polyps, say for example, serrated polyposis, you'll have multiple polyps. And uh, I've had patients where I resected a large polyp and by the side, and I close it with the clips, and by the side of it, there is another medium-sized polyp. I do not resect that polyp immediately because anyhow, to come back to resect more polyps. And uh, the reason is if, the, if my resection, during my resection, my snare touches the clips of the previous resection, I will create an unnecessary problem for myself. So something to keep in mind. So the other thing is, as you can see, this diagram tells about how far deep the current goes with the heat energy. And uh, as the energy goes down, you're going to have devitalization of the tissue that results in two problems. One is delayed bleeding. And the second problem is post polypectomy syndrome. And you could have minimized those issues by getting into the habit of injecting submucosal saline and lifting it. And I must say the submucosal saline to lift the lesion is not a new concept. It was first described way back in the early 1970s, uh, especially around the time when, the, when uh, uh, Dr. Shinya first did uh, reported his polypectomy experience in New England Journal of Medicine. And I hope uh, this uh, uh, class is useful and I, I will stop here and we'll open the uh, platform for discussion. I want to invite uh, 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 Joseph. Uh, he has done an interesting study. He will explain uh, what he has done. And then I want to invite uh, Duke, Roy and Selvi. And I will also invite uh, Dr. Graham. You know, he has a lot of experience. Uh, to share their uh, wisdom. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Oh, wonderful. I'm Joseph Song. I'm one of the junior faculty here at AMI Anderson. It's great to see everybody here. And thank you, Dr. Raju, for that excellent, very clear, delineated uh, concepts in electrosurgery. Um, you know, this is an area that sort of fascinated me during training because, uh, you know, early on during training, um, I always kind of wondered, you know, what, whose responsibility was it to 
manage the you know the ESU machine you know and, and its settings and it, there were definitely times when I felt like we took it for granted that the our endoscopy tech was were the ones who were responsible for the settings so that you know we would say hey we want to do a hot snare and we just take it for granted that the settings would be there for us um, and uh, and actually uh, uh, we had. Fortunately, every year we had Duke come by and give us a lecture on ESU and how to manipulate and navigate the Irby machine, um, and that gave me some more insight into the fact that, you know, as gastroenterologists, it's actually our responsibility. Um, as Duke actually put it very nicely, it's, uh, it's like writing a prescription for a patient, and we have to know these settings that we're, we're you know, implementing, and, and it's just like writing prescription and dosage, um, and this has a lot of implications on patient safety and adverse events. Um, surgery is actually way ahead of us in this game. Um, uh, Ten years ago, the surgery actually realized that this was an issue for them, and they actually, what they, annually, they reported something like 40,000 thermal injuries because of the use of electrosurgery. surgery even 400 OR fires a year. And so surgery got way ahead of this game. They recognized this was an issue, uh, both for their uh, surgeons as well as for their patients. Um, so they actually devised a curriculum, and actually this curriculum is um, uh, it's called the FUSES curriculum, or the fund Fundamental Use of um, uh, Surgical Energy. And they actually uh, create, uh, developed this book here. Um, and so this is actually a manual that all the surgeons actually uh, probably are very familiar with that goes through a lot of the electrosurgical principles and how to uh, implement uh, the uses safely. Um, so, so throughout the training, I kind of wonder, you know, what, you know, what, what was, you know, what, what, what do we as endoscopy technicians, what do we as endoscopy trainees, what, you know, what should we know, uh, and are we at, on par with the knowledge that we're supposed to uh, have so that we can implement the ESU properly and safely uh, in the endoscopy unit? So. Um, I thought of this uh, sort of pilot project that um, I, I ended up implementing, and I, I, I uh, brought in Sanji Suresh and Dr. Raju to help out, uh, and we developed a, a longitudinal study, a fairly simple study where we did a survey-based uh, type of situation where we looked at what's the baseline knowledge uh, in trainees and technicians, uh, and to see, you know, uh, at baseline, I hypothesized that everyone's going to be a little bit rusty. There's not, not everyone's going to score 100 percent on it. But I hypothesized too that perhaps the endoscopy technicians may actually uh, have a leg up compared to the trainees um, because they're, they're they're implementing the the settings and maybe the trainees are, are probably not as uh, fluid or um, uh, 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 well versed in this area. So I'm going to um, let me f uh, go ahead and show the results of this study because I, I feel that's very telling. Let me see if I can go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can everybody see the screen? It's taking time. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. All right. So, so basically, we, we invited um, trainees and endoscopy technicians from an academic center here in Houston, and we basically did uh, a few things. One, we, we set out to create a, uh, a multiple choice exam uh, based on 15 objectives, concepts like bipolar, monopolar instruments, their applications, APC, RFA. Uh, things that uh, I, I felt that I should have known graduating from a, a training program and certainly in practice uh, having, uh, I feel like I must know uh, as I'm doing uh, endoscopic uh, therapeutics. Um, so we devised a, a multiple choice exam based on 15 uh, objectives. We uh, basically uh, asked the participants to uh, report what's their comfort level at baseline, their knowledge, and what's their comfort level with operating the ESU. Uh, and then we gave them the test. We told them to take the test, and then we uh, had a lecture, uh, a one-hour lecture, based uh, very similar to, to the one that was just given, on those based on those objectives. And uh, thank you, Duke, for uh, providing a very, uh, t uh, you know, very important lecture here because this, this actually we know some uh, uh, some good outcomes from from this uh, study. So, uh, and we basically uh, graded those exams. And after about uh, one or two weeks, we did a uh, hands-on training session uh, with whoever uh, was able to participate. 
and we went through a hands-on session where uh, Duke actually uh, guided all of us through um, how to operate the ESU, and then had each participant actually demonstrate that they can go through each, you know, pushing the, the buttons, knowing where to navigate and how to navigate the ESU. And then three months, and, and I actually uh, got this idea because the, the, uh, in the surgical literature, uh, they actually, there's a handful of studies where they looked at this, and they found that the, the durability of knowledge is not always greatest. And even at six months, durability of knowledge can often dissipate. And so we did a three-month follow-up, seeing if, there's, there, uh, if we can get similar test scores or improvement in test scores based on uh, after implementation of a lecture and a hands-on session. And so here are the results. You can see that um, if we look here, let me go ahead and get the highlighter, laser pointer. Okay, so uh, look at this graph here. This is before the lecture series. Uh, so this is baseline knowledge. The black represents all the trainees. We actually had a surgical resident who was actually able to participate. Uh, and we had uh, some endoscopy technicians who participated uh, in this study. So you can see it's kind of all over the place. And as it turns out, uh, my hypothesis was wrong. Um, you know, the, the endoscopy technicians uh, didn't necessarily score higher than the fellows, and even the fe within, amongst the fellows, um, we see that it didn't really matter what year you were. Um, you know, we had a first year that actually scored probably higher than even second or third year fellows. Um, so there was actually no relationship between the level of training uh, and the extent of knowledge. So then we did it um, after session two, where they've already had the lecture, the, the didactic, we, they had the hands-on. Well, reserve score, well, the, the actual participation rate wasn't the greatest, but at least we still had some data. And we showed that, well, you know, actually turns out there, um, the fellows that did participate actually did uh, demonstrate some improvement in their test scores. And by the way, they, they didn't get, never got the answers to these test scores so, or to these test questions. So it was up to them to find out the answers to, to, um, uh, to these questions. And it was the exact same uh, exam each time, so, uh, so we didn't change anything there. Um, then at three months, we implemented a, uh, a survey uh, online. Uh, we distributed amongst the, all the original participants, and we see, you know, how many of them would participate and what were they, uh, what were they scoring. Um, and as it turns out, amongst the endoscopy technicians, uh, even though they didn't uh, participate in part two, we do see that their overall score did actually uh, improve uh, over three months. You know, granted, it's not 100% or even close to 90%, but it's better than what it used to be. Same thing for the, uh, the majority of the fellows. We see an overall increase in their uh, test scores. But no one really quite reached above 90%. I was hoping that we could, and, you know, could uh, get them all to score um, almost perfect on these, on these uh, questions because they were the exact same questions each time. Um, so what this tells us that, yes, um, you know, uh, sessions like these where we talk about the principles and talk about the execution of the, the ESU operations, it, it is important. It, it probably can improve uh, knowledge base and hopefully um, uh, have an impact on uh, actual practice uh, in the clinical and endoscopic setting, uh, but that we have to maintain uh, this type of knowledge. It, it can't, uh, you know, we, uh, maybe one year may not be enough. We may have to, you know, every two, every uh, twice a year maybe we have to be doing these lectures um, and seeing if, if people, hopefully by the time they graduate, especially the trainees, that they'll be scoring close to or at 100% because um, the, the, the content of the, the exam I feel are, are absolutely fundamental to um, being out there in practice. And all the times that uh, we didn't, I feel like as a trainee where I didn't pay attention to it or, or all the times we got lucky um, because, you know, for all we know, you, if you're setting, if you have, you know, if we were doing a sessile polyp polypectomy uh, in the CECA, for instance, and, you're, and you unknowingly had your effect at four and your uh, interval at six, like that, you're putting that patient at risk for perforation or at least deep thermal injury. So, so it's very, uh, I feel it's absolutely uh, vital that the, as endoscopists and certainly as trainees that we learn this early uh, so that we can know how to navigate and, uh, and tailor uh, the settings to uh, the polyps that we're removing and whatever intervention that we're doing. So, um, uh, Sanji, uh, you know, you were uh, absolutely a, a very important part of this, uh, our study here. Do you have any comments on some of the, maybe the challenges that we faced uh, in implementing this? Um, yeah, thank you. That was, um, that was great. Um, I think that, um, like you said, the major challenges were just ensuring that 
um, there was continuity in, um, in like participation throughout the study. And I, I think that that is also a very um, uh, realistic problem to face in the implementation of, of any educational intervention um, when, you know, there is, um, when it kind of requires um, like the uh, initiative or participation of, of people on their own time, you always have that. Um, and even with sessions like these, um, people are, you know, people can come to certain sessions and not others. And so um, when we think about implementing a longstanding program in GI um, around this issue and, and educating um, fellows and technicians about this issue, um, that's something that we certainly have to continue to think about is how, how do we um, ensure that um, that there is that continuity in, in, um, in the educational experience. Right. I, I, I can, yeah. So let's invite and uh, yeah. Roy, uh, and then we can uh, answer, so we can uh, look at some other questions. Um, all right, Dirk. First of all, we want to thank you for educating us. You are the master educator for electrosurgery in Houston. Thank you for joining. Uh, we want to make sure that you train every tech and every nurse in the whole Houston that they are, they become like you. But we'll make sure that they will not take your job. <laughs> <laughs> so much, Dr. Raju and uh, and Dr. Zane, everybody else that's on there. and. Um, you know, thank you for the kind words. Um, I think Dr. Raju pretty much um, covered all the aspect of um, the electrosurgery piece as far as on the equipment side, on my side. I think what's the most important thing is that, um, and Dr. Raju pointed out, and Dr. Zane pointed out as well, is that you gotta be able to understand, um, part of my job is going in there and doing in-services, which that's my that's my passion and what i noticed is that going into you know this is my 10th year with derby is that every single year um i go in there they get very enthusiastic they want to learn all the buttons and all this good stuff but everybody seems to forget the basic fundamentals of electrosurgery which dr raju covered very very well um because you understand that the fundamental the equipment is going to actually do more harm than good for your patients. So I see some of the chat questions that came up and I think Dr. Um, uh, Tara Murthy is gonna cover that. And I, one of them is basically the settings. If you can understand what exactly is endocut Q versus endocut I, the effect, the interval, the durations, and understanding all the coag, the difference between the cut and the coag, just period between just, just take away the endocut Q and endocut I. What is the cut current and what is the coag current? If you can understand that, you know, the basic two current, and that's gonna help you with any type of polyps or any situation that you're in when you're doing a, you know, um, a colonoscopy. So you're, you're able to say, okay, you know what? This is a very thin tissue on anatomy. So basically I want as much, as less as coag as possible. And, or maybe sometimes just go with a coast snare, just like Dr. Raju said. Sometimes that's probably your best bet just to protect the two things that Dr. Roger pointed out, delay bleeding and post polypectomy. So um, it's my job. So I, I just love going in there. Matter of fact, it's because of this COVID, I'm actually pretty, um, pretty sad not being able to go out there. And, um, but I've been booked for next year already with the UT fellows to go in and do a course for them, which is basically, you know, um, that's, what, that's what I'm very passionate about. And I'm, I'm able to share all the experiences firsthand as far as you know uh, what you have to do when you run into this kind of polyp and once again i'm just so happy that dr raju Kerber on his slide so thoroughly as far as what you have to do and where the equipment is and i think that's one of the things that when i first engaged with dr raju that he you know it's like where is the equipment and most of the time nine out of ten even today that i go into an account the doctors does not even see where the equipment is and they always ask the tech to turn on the equipment you know or some of the questions they always ask is like you know i never hear a question i never hear a doctor ask the tech this question what settings 
is the RB on. They automatically trust the tech 100% that is on the right settings. What happens if you have a doctor that just finished doing a pedunculated polyp in the, in the rectum and he has the coag up really high, okay? And then you walk in there, you're doing a polypectomy in the cecum. You're using the same setting. What's just going to happen? So always ask. I think uh, one of the good practices, I think I'm going to share this with Dr. Zhang as well. Probably one of the questions we're going to basically incorporate in there as we go into doing another course um, is basically, does, you know, do you walk in a room and ask your tech, you know, is the RB on this setting or that setting? Or where is the equipment facing? Is it facing you or is it behind your back? And so the thing that's very important. So I'm love to go out there. So wherever you at in, in the whole wide world, you can get involved with your RB technician or your RB rep. And we'll be happy to go out there and educate any of you guys and create, you know, program just for you that have your name on there, just like Dr. Roger point out. We can customize it based on even anatomical locations, you know, going from the rectum to the cecum. Um, and we can customize that for you all. So that way it makes your job so much easier. Hi, Duke. So um, thanks so much for everything that you do for all of the um, endoscopy units in Houston and for MD Anderson as well. Since you mentioned um, different settings for different parts of the GI tract, can you kind of quickly comment on that? That was one of the questions that um, came up in the chat. Yes, ma'am. So um, back on Dr. Roger's slide, as we go from the rectum to the cecum, the tissue wall becomes thinner and thinner and thinner. So, you know, the whole point of understanding the difference between a cut and a coac is actually tied into the tissue wall thickness, right? So if you have, for example, you have a large pedunculated polyp, you inject it with saline, you have a nice little cushion, okay? And you protect the muscularis really well. So here, you can actually very, be very aggressive and you can actually, you know, have to go straight to coac if you really want to and be comfortable going, knowing the fact that there's a blood vessel that's feeding that pedunculated polyp, but then you also have the saline or the water that's protecting the muscle, okay? So understand that vice versa, when you go into the cecum, even though you're lifted, you inject it with saline, now you're basically going to from a four millimeter thickness to about one to two millimeter thickness before you get to the muscle. So you can make your judgment by understanding, you know, the endocut, the effect, the interval, the durations will help you control when you're in a thin tissue wall anatomy, you basically want to reduce or even drop down the coag period and go with a straight cut. Now, what I've seen over my years is, and I think Dr. Raj and all the doctors is on here, is that most of the good endoscopists, they rather see immediate bleeders than having delayed bleeding. So that way they can treat it right away because even though once you get the polyp removed, you see a really nice blanching and a little crater, you look at it, it's like there's no bleeding. You're like, oh, that looks good. But actually, that's actually look really bad. If you have a little crater and a blanching, that is a 100% delayed bleeding or post pedunculate issue. So um, hope that answers your question. So understanding, you know, the, the endo cut, the setting, the effect, the duration, the interval, will help you determine the tissue wall anatomy or where you have to set your settings. Thank you so much again, Duke. Dr. Satikno had a comment about monopolar versus bipolar. Dr. Satikno, would you like to um, add more to your comment, sir? Right. Hi. I, uh, sorry, that I, I, I wasn't uh, on mute. Uh, I think that one of the purpose of having the ERB is that we have uh, a way to standardize our uh, settings. And uh, uh, I must tell you that for a long time, maybe about 10 years, we actually have like a standardized setting for EMR, for ESD and ESD is uh, uh, divided into like whether you're doing a, a marking, circumferential cut, or a dissections, and it's a very very simplified uh, um, settings that we basically just choose and never really touch 
into this uh, changing the effect and all of these uh, things. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, uh, the, the system has been copied and used. And uh, if I think about my friends in Japan, they also have uh, standardized settings. So I'm uh, uh, a little bit baffled that uh, you have to uh, go through uh, in a, in uh, every single set, uh, every single situation that you have to like, do I change this thing? Do I change that thing? Uh, aren't you like uh, negating the impact of having a $70,000 or $60,000 machine by having to uh, be thinking about all of these things? I so, thought all of these things could be simplified. Right. So it's very interesting. Uh, uh, let me answer this thing and I want uh, Duke to uh, follow up on that. Uh, if you look at a typical endoscopy unit, a large unit in the US, right? There are uh, probably anywhere between 10 to 15 to 40 to 50 endoscopists in a center, right? And uh, it's also interesting that most of the endoscopists would want uh, uh, their name set up for, this, uh, for that setting, right? You know, everybody wants their name attached to a particular setting, okay? Uh, it makes sense to really make it uniform and say, okay, colon EMR, 10 millimeter polyp, this is a setting. Colon EMR, piecemeal resection, this is a setting. And uh, to set it up that way, uh, you'll have, you will probably need, if including ESD, you probably need less than 10 total set, pre preset settings, you know, no, not, not more than that. But, uh, Typically what happens is the machine comes with the company standard settings and then uh, each individual physician comes up with their own settings and the settings can increase to maybe 50, 60. As long as you understand, as long as like you know, Roy, you understand the principles for a first year fellow or a second year fellow who doesn't understand the principles, understanding the principles will help them uh, make those uh, subtle changes that they need to do because it is not the setting that ultimately uh, defines whether you're going to get a particular outcome because setting is one, but how you close the snare, how much of a current you're going to apply through your pedal, all those things are variable from person to person. So, you know, I understand, I, I, feel that it makes sense to have a defined setting to make it easy for everybody. But for the sake of fellows, understanding these uh, uh, principles behind the effect, duration, and interval uh, will help them uh, appreciate and change if they need to, because not every polyp is exactly the same. Uh, I, 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 that, that part, I completely agree that they need to understand. Uh, but in in a given day-to-day uh, -day basis, I think most of the time you can uh, uh, you can say, okay, uh, the, I'm doing an EMR. Uh, you know, go go get me to the, the the EMR setting, and and that's where I want to operate at. No, uh, I agree. I agree with that. Yes. And, and Dr. Soteno, you're 100% right. There is basically standard settings. And yes, the Irby would basically will deliver what you need. But um, what I was trying to basically say and trying to really piggyback in is that by understanding all the nuances, um, then, then will help you determine, okay, this is what I want as a standardized EMR, ESD, and so forth. Right? Yes. Yeah. So... Um, most of my account in Houston, they have their standard default settings because they understand, because I think I've done um, a fairly decent job enough to explain to a lot of these endoscopists the difference between, you know, endocut Q, the effect, the duration. And so they're on basically autopilot, just like you said. Yes, you're spending $40,000 this Irby, it should drive itself, and it does. But a lot of time is that sometime what I'm trying to get in is that the key thing is that different doctors go to different rooms and they go back to the same room and they never looked at the Irby or what setting that was set on previously. And they always rely on whatever, you know, um, that setting was set last 
So that's what I was trying to clear. But yes, most of the default settings that you have on there will help you on a day-to-day -day basis. But for the first year or the first year, second year you know, fellows or some endoscopists that have no clue what is Indocut Q is or what, you know, why am I using a cut versus coag? Oh, and, okay. okay. Yes, okay. sir. And believe it, I've seen a lot. And it, just, it scares me when I'm in that room when they step on a, on a basically a forced coag, effect 225 watt, trying to remove a sessile polyp in the cecum. I think my, most of the time, man, the questions that are asked is like, do I use yellow or blue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're 100% right. Yeah, I think for, uh, you know, I think that's, that's something we should address because I think one of the biggest um, mistakes that I've seen is, uh, especially on the Orbit machine, is knowing when to actually use blue and when to use yellow because I've seen this used improperly. And if, if used improperly, you're not leveraging the actual benefits of EndoCut Q. Um, so do, do you want to clarify that for everybody? Yes, yeah, it's, yeah, just back to what the Dr. Sotino just said. It's like, which pedal I, you know, which foot pedal I step on? What is blue and what is cut? I think on one of the exam questions was that, what is the yellow foot pedal? What is the coax? And I'm so shocked that some doctors don't even know because they're so used to just stepping on the blue foot pedal for everything, okay? Mm. Or when they're using Indocut Q, they basically tamponading on it. They rapidly, you know, just tap, tap, tap. So it takes away the whole purpose or the benefits of an Indocut Q because you got to hold down on a foot pedal to, to recite to get the actual true effect on the tissue. You know, if you just rapidly tap on it, you're just getting, you know, a lot of them don't know, you just, basically you're getting a pure cut. And that's why when they see, it's like, hey dude, I'm using Indocut Q, but I'm seeing a lot of bleeding. When I'm there observing them, guess what they're doing? They're tapping on the cut, tap, 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 and they're getting a pure cut. So I have to go through the whole process and explaining it. So um, another couple of questions, if I can just jump in um, for either Raju or Dr. Sutikno. Um, one of somebody was asking, um, Faisal Abu Bakr was asking, how do I know the extent of resection of a pedunculated polyp so I don't miss any of it? Um, how do you, uh, Raju and Dr. Sutikno, examine a post polypectomy site to make sure that all of the um, tissue is gone, or what maneuvers do you do to make sure that all of the tissue is gone? Brian, you want to take? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. I think what he meant is uh, how do we know how far to go uh, for, uh, for a flat lesion, right? Pedunculated, pedun actually, it says. For pedunculated. Mm -hmm. For pedunculated, it's like what Raji was saying, is that uh, you, you try to cut it at about uh, at the middle of the stalk. Um, I think if you have a very short stalk or, um, or something you cannot see, you might as well as just do a, a submucosal injection and just uh, treat it like uh, you're treating a sessile polyp. That's also fine. Uh, the issue about pedunculated is actually really uh, uh, more of the risk of the bleeding, but that's not the question. Um, go ahead, Raju. So I think uh, and this is a question by Faisal. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Faisal, if you think that the polyp, pedunculated polyp head looks like there is cancer there, I try to cut as low as possible on the stock. Uh, making sure that I inject the base of the stock to lift it uh, so that uh, I do not end up with a delayed perforation because that's the main concern that I have. Uh, the reason I want to cut as low as possible is uh, so that when they look at the, uh, the Haggis classification, we have enough distance uh, from the cancer to the resection margin and if there's enough distance, you could avoid uh, and if, uh, hoping that it's a well-differentiated or moderately differentiated cancer and there is no lymphovascular invasion, you could avoid surgery. So that's, the, uh, that's how I do when I think about a cancer in a pedunculated polyp. Uh, the second question is, uh, uh, how do you examine the base? And how do you know whether the polyp has been completely removed in a flat lesion or a, a sessile lesion? Is 
I want to suggest two things for you. One is make sure you get into the habit of putting a cap at the end of your scope and wherever possible uh, for resections, uh, if it is possible, uh, take an adult colonoscope. Uh, you know, if you have Olympus, I would pick an adult colonoscope from Olympus uh, because it has a near focus uh, function. So these two things, uh, cap, adult scope. And the third thing is to make sure that when you inject, you use either methylene blue or indigo carmine in the solution. So once you inject and resect and you see a nice clean blue base uh, with a cotton wool appearance, that means the resection is limited to submucosa. If you see white bands, that means you already have cut deep and you're probably seeing muscle, okay. Once I cut, I use my cap fitted scope and uh, go around the resection site, millimeter by millimeter. And actually in my practice, I take photos of the edge completely to make sure that I don't see any polyp tissue. Uh, if I see polyp tissue that is visible to my eye, I do not burn that. I basically use a hot biopsy forceps or a cold biopsy forceps, or if it is a large amount, either a cold snare or a hot snare to cut it. If it is macroscopically visible polyp tissue, I cut. If I don't see anything, and it, I think it is a clean edge, I make sure that I document it's a clean edge, and then I ablate that edge with either APC or a, a cold, uh, a soft coagulation, uh, snare tip coagulation. One of the two you could use. I prefer to use APC. That's been, that's what I've been using for the last 10 years. And uh, we documented that you could have a very low recurrence for large polyps, about 20 millimeters, a recurrence rate of about 3%, 3 to 4%. But you need to get into the habit of uh, including multiple things, adult scope, cap, and carefully examining documenting. And even if the pathologist says the margin is positive with an end block resection of say, for example, 20 millimeter polyp, you could end block resect, margin is positive, peripheral margin is positive. And we have no recurrence in any one of those patients, end block resection where outside margin that we saw was clean and we routinely applied uh, APC to that edge. We had no, almost uh, in end block resections, we had no recurrence. It's almost zero. So. Okay, do we have time for one more question, Raju? Uh, one of our technicians is asking, when we're getting ready to close the handle of the snare, how quickly should we close? What's the best recommendation when training a new technician during this step? All right, I'll let uh, Duke answer that and then I will answer. Go ahead, Duke. So I think the best, um, what I've seen, and this is, once again, I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you how the actual equipment and the snare, the modality you're using, will help in aiming that tissue. So first of all, um, just a snug, not the tight, it's like you're holding something snug, like you know, a, a, um, a, baby, you know, a baby bird in your hand. Snug it. Usually, I think 90% of the time, what I hear the doctors close, as he closed, when he stepped on a foot pedal, he asks you to close, you should automatically see it, it happens in millisecond, white blanking immediately will take effect around the tissue, okay? Then who asked you to close, did you take another close? So you will basically see the current delivering through that tissue as you take another close until the polyp just falls off. So it's good that I'm glad that uh, uh, Duke emphasized that snug. It's uh, snug. You know, we talked about the current density, right? If you have a snare that is just touching, you'll have the maximum current density for it to start the cut. On the other hand, you squeeze, you may have too much of tissue surrounding that snare and the heat generated is not a, sufficient to cut. Although, you know, this is a problem like we talked about uh, 
we saw with older generators, with newer generators, where they change the uh, voltage depending upon the impedance, it does uh, seem to be less of a problem. But for the sake of fellows, I would suggest that you take the snare into your hand and you get into the habit of uh, closing and learning because that is an important uh, uh, aspect of your resection. And once you finish your training, you go into a practice, an academic practice or a community practice, and you have technicians with different skill sets. Uh, you, you may be wondering how come I'm having more bleeding now than what I had uh, during my fellowship. It's because your technician may not be uh, doing it uh, properly and you want to avoid that. In snare resection, it's not only your settings, but how you close makes a big difference. To me, irrespective of what settings you use, if you know how to handle the snare, that's what it delivers the energy. And that energy is going to the, do the job that you want. Even though the settings are standardized, this and how you put your uh, foot on the pedal makes a big difference. All right. If there are no other questions, I think we went quite a bit. Actually, we are supposed to be one hour, but we went uh, a little bit longer. And I want to uh, thank everybody. Um, but I also want Selby to make an announcement. Uh, okay, thanks, Raju. Um, just um, about next week's uh, Zoom session, um, I will be speaking about small bowel anatomy and physiology and endoscopy. So we hope that you guys can join us again. Um, it's 9.30 for the session next Sunday. Um, and if you don't have the link, Dr. Raju will send it out. Um, and 9.15, if you have any other questions, maybe that weren't answered today in terms of endoscopy, um, you're welcome to join at 9.15. We'll be here and uh, happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Raju. And you want to talk about Dr. Graham? So uh, Dr. Graham was on the call uh, on this session earlier. It looks like he's logged off, but the following week, which is August 23rd, again at 9.30, um, Dr. Graham will be um, doing a presentation on lifelong learning um, in gastroenterology for uh, trainees and junior faculty and uh, all of the rest of us. Um, and then it would be an open forum with uh, fellows who are able to participate and ask questions. And it'll, it should be a very nice discussion. He's um, really a master uh, in gastroenterology. And I think he has a lot of knowledge. I know he has a lot of knowledge to offer us and a lot of advice. Um, and I know I'm looking forward uh, to August 23rd uh, for the open forum with Dr. David Graham. Laura, any last minute comments? Yes, Dr. Rayu. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to say that, you know, anytime that they're playing with the settings and changing the settings, make sure, you know, that your uh, pedal is not disabled because it happens when you are playing with your settings, sometimes you disable the pedals and then you are on the middle of the procedure and your RB is not working. So make sure that you check that your pedals are working and the, your grounding pad is, um, is also connected you know, that you have a good contact with the patient and the grounding pad because those are, um, those are a lot of the troubleshooting that, you know, I encounter sometimes on the middle of the procedure. So just make sure you have your uh, pedals assigned and your grounding pad is connected. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take care.